good evening, everybody. Uh, it's lovely to be here, and uh, I, I thank you for allowing me to, to share my talk with you. So I'm going to spend uh, about 45 minutes, roughly, uh, just sharing with you a bit about my Paralympic career and my history and some of the lessons I learned along the way. And then obviously talk a little bit about the Vendée. As the title would suggest, uh, I'm planning to sail around the world and I can't in fact open a tin. So if anybody has any, any ideas on how that's possible with one hand, just uh, let me know. I absolutely love this quote. For everything you have missed, you have gained something else. Now, Ralph Waldo Emerson's words are some that I can truly relate to. I was born without my right arm, but weirdly, what I lack in arms, I make up for in kidneys. So a fun fact for you, I was born with three kidneys. So something clearly went wrong there in the allocation of body parts. Here's a little bit about me. I'm a four-time Paralympian. I've had the, the very great privilege to represent Great Britain at four Paralympic Games, starting in Athens and finishing up in Rio de Janeiro. I'm a triple world champion. Um, I'm 35 years old. And I know I do joke about my weight. I will explain that a bit later on because it's been a huge part of my sailing journey. And currently I'm based on the, the south coast and uh, spending as much time as physically possible on a boat. Now, growing up, I knew I was a bit different and I really struggled with bullying and being accepted because of my disability. I was given a prosthetic from the NHS and at the time it was a hook. So I ended up with the nickname Captain Herc, which as a young child was quite hard to deal with. I never really accepted that I was disabled. So much so that uh, one day I decided to take my prosthetic off in a supermarket and lob it into the frozen food section. I actually didn't enjoy wearing them and I didn't feel the need to wear them because to me, I felt normal the way I was. I had this need to be just like everybody else and wearing a prosthetic was making me different. So funnily enough, from that moment on, my mum, obviously dying of embarrassment at this point, uh, realised that prosthetics just weren't for me. Weirdly, I had a very different attitude to disability sport. I loved sailing. I'd been sailing from the age of three with my parents. They're very strong sailors in their own right, although they'll never admit to that. But both of them sailed at a very high level in the my, my dad sailed in the Hornet and 505 class and my mum in the 470. So sailing for me was a way to be just like everybody else. I could jump in a boat and I could be normal. I could be me. So I then developed this attitude, which was, well, if I can do this, I can go in a boat and be like everybody else. Why would I want to do anything related to disability sport? To me, it seemed like the weaker option and something I wouldn't even entertain the idea of. Until one day, I met a man named Andy Castles uh, from the Isle of Wight, and he was the Atlanta gold medalist in the sonar class. Now, Andy was training for the Sydney Paralympic Games at the time I met him. And he'd heard about this girl with a disability that had been racing on the able-bodied circuit in the 29ers and doing okay. So he invited me to go and train with him. And I remember having a screaming fit with my mother about going because I, I didn't want to. I didn't want to entertain disability sport in any format, even training with them. So I reluctantly went to the Isle of Wight to train with Andy. And it was at that moment that I realized how wrong I had it. Disability sport wasn't weaker. It was exactly the same. Sailing as a disabled athlete was the same. It was the same boats, the same race courses. It was just done by people with disabilities. 
And Andy really put me on the path towards the Paralympics and made me realise that it wasn't it wasn't going to be a weaker option for me. It was something I should aim for. So I did. And in 2000, I met John Robertson, who is an ex RAF bomb technician. Now, John is an advert for not riding a motorcycle. So I apologize if anybody is a really big fan of motorcycles. Unfortunately for John, uh, an accident on a corner at a slightly increased speed, shall we say, resulted in a, a really bad crash. And John was paralyzed from the chest down. Luckily, John was a sailor prior to having his accident. And as part of his rehabilitation, he went back to sailing. So I met John in 2000 and we decided to form a team to go up against my mentor, my inspiration, Andy Castles. But we would need three people to race the sonar. Now the sonar is a big old keelboat. It's 23 foot long and it weighs in at just under a tonne. So you need uh, some people who are fairly strong and fairly efficient uh, in weight terms. The sonar is normally raced by four able-bodied people. So to sail it with three disabled people is a bit of a challenge. So John and I searched for our third crew member for ages and we just could not find someone that fitted the bill. You see in Paralympic sailing, you're classified on a scale of one through seven. So any disability can go sailing, but you have to be classified and in the sonar, you have to add up to 14 points. So one is the least disabled and seven, sorry, one is the most disabled and seven is the least disabled. I myself classify as a six, John classifies as a two. So between us, we knew we would need another six points to make up our 14, allowing for the sonar. And we searched for months, months and months, and we just could not find the right disability, the right body type, or indeed the right personality to fit our crew. Until one day, Tesco's gave us the answer. Now, John and I are sitting in the car, and we're in a disabled bay, and I'm waiting for John to get out of the car into his wheelchair so we can go off and get our shopping. In the row in front of us, we see this scene unfold where another man uh, in a wheelchair is getting out of his car into the wheelchair. Now, I don't know what happened, but something unbalanced him. And as a result, this poor man ended up on the floor of the car park and his wheelchair flew off across the car park. The next thing we see is this absolutely massive guy coming back over with the wheelchair. Now, he's a double leg amputee. And he goes over to the guy on the floor, he picks him up, he puts him in the wheelchair and he carries on into Tesco's. Now, the whole time we've watched this scene unfold and John goes, that's him. That's the guy we need. So I then have to chase down this poor man in Tesco's. I mean, who knows what he thought? He must have thought I was a crazy person to say, excuse me, do you fancy sailing? Have you tried Paralympic sport? Now, luckily for me, Steve has got a fairly good sense of humour and he does enjoy a challenge. And he said yes. Having never been on even a ferry, Steve decided that he would give sailing a go, which was fortunate for us. Now, Steve lost his legs due to meningitis, um, but prior to losing his legs, he was a very strong rugby player. He actually played for Wales under 18s. So he was definitely an athlete and we knew that. He was built like a tank. He was incredibly strong, but he also learned very quickly, which was lucky because I still remember he turned up to our first ever regatta together with the Dorling Kindersley Guide to Sailing. So we should have been worried, but luckily for us, he picked things up unbelievably quickly and it just clicked. And that was us. We formed our sonar sailing team. Now, of course, it wasn't just us. We're very lucky within the British sailing team system to have an immense amount of support. Coaches, support staff, 
ranging from physiotherapists to nutritionists to boat preparation, you name it, the British sailing team has it. And it's an incredibly well organized team. And in our particular case, we were also lucky to have tuning crew. So we had a team of able-bodied sailors who would race another sonar against us to get us up to speed prior to regattas or help us test things like new masts or new sails. So we were really fortunate to have this amazing setup and quite frankly, an amazing team to be a part of. So John, Steve and myself were together as a team for 16 years. And we were one of the few teams that actually stuck together through thick and thin. Now you turn up at world championships and you'll quite often see a different crew in the foreign team's boats. You know, you've had a falling out on the water or something's gone wrong behind the scenes and someone's left or been pushed out. And I think for us, the fact that we could stick together through thick and thin, through all of the trials we had, was one of our greatest super strengths. We had some very firm rules where everything was left on the water. Even if you'd said some bad words to each other sailing, they weren't brought ashore. We also realized very quickly that our strength laid in our individuality. There's a tool called the Insights Profiling Tool, which is a, a personality tool and with our coach as a fourth person, interestingly enough, we were all four different types of personalities. And I can only reason that that was perhaps one of the reasons we functioned so well as a team. We complemented each other both on and off the water, so much so that we were nicknamed the married threesome. I was one of the only women that raced on the sonar circuit. And the married threesome was a pretty terrible nickname to have. But I think we took it in, in good form and we took it as good natured because to us, it was a strength that we were so close as a unit, as a team. Of course, Paralympic sailing is wonderful. And when you look at social media and everything today, it looks magnificent, right? There's, you know gorgeous sailing shots and we spend as a sonar team four months a year in Miami training over the winter because it's nice to sail in the sunshine so that's all fabulous but it isn't all the sunshine and rainbows that perhaps you think it is it is relentless campaigning for a Paralympic Games it is year-long and endless training you do not stop because it's cold. You do not stop because it's Christmas. We would train right up until. Then there's the battle for funding. We're really lucky in the UK that we have the support of the lottery. But the lottery only funds around 50% of our budget. So the rest has to be found either through sponsorship or donations or working another job to sustain you. Then, of course, there's the drug testing. When you're at the elite level of Olympic and Paralympic level, you are subject to drugs testing and whereabouts locations. You have to tell UK Sport where you are so that they can come and test you. And it's quite intrusive having to remember that you've told someone you're going to be in the gym at this time. So therefore, you have to be in the gym at the time or being on the water and coming back to a pontoon to be faced by drug testers or being woken at six o'clock in the morning by a drugs tester and also getting to know them quite well in the fact that they have to physically watch you give a sample. Performance anxiety is a real thing when it comes to that because they have to watch everything. The weight gain. For me, that was a massive thing. The best sonar team were the Australians, and we realised that we weighed 90 kilograms less collectively than they did as a team. So we put on the weight, and I'll explain a bit more about that shortly. We missed out on normal life. 
there wasn't the going out clubbing. I still, to this day, have never been in a nightclub. There were the rules around drinking. There were the things we missed from family birthdays because you were away at a regatta to missing your best friend's wedding because you're racing. We missed out on all of those things that would be classified as normal life. And it was tough at times to say to people, I'm really sorry, I can't come to your wedding because I'm away racing. Because not everyone understands why you would give up so much to go racing. And then there was the mental pressure that, of course, all of this puts on you. It's a bit like living in a pressure cooker. It's how long you can sustain yourself under this pressure and still perform. And ultimately, does that pressure make you perform better? I said I'd get to the weight gain. <laughs> Obviously, we had 90 kilograms to find but it was not something we were ever going to be able to do. So we aimed to put on around 20 kilograms, which was still a lot when you divided that between Steve and myself. So by London, I was, I thought I was my heaviest. I was wrong, of course. I'd gained over six kilograms from my natural body weight to compete in London 2012. Unfortunately, that wasn't enough. And by Rio, I'd got up to the absolute heaviest I'd ever been. And it was quite staggering the lengths we had to go to to get to fighting weight, which included things like stopping training and eating endlessly and upping weightlifting and endless supplements and working out how much weight we could get into our clothing legally because obviously you're only allowed 13 kilograms of clothes etc so we did everything we could to put on as much weight as was physically possible and it really really dented my self-confidence but what I had in the back of my mind was that the very clever scientists behind the British sailing team had worked out that 20 kilogram gain would would get us half a boat length so just over 11 and a bit feet per lap in terms of speed gained on the sonar so we knew it was something we had to do so in the back of my mind every time I looked at myself in the mirror and thought oh my god you look horrendous what have you done to yourself I could think right I'm doing this because it's gaining me boat lengths it's gaining me speed on the race course and it's gaining me what I ultimately want to achieve, which is medals. So was it worth it? Well, yes and no. It took me a long time to feel proud of my achievements to date. Now that sounds really weird because not many people can say they've competed at four Paralympic Games we're still to this day the only team to retain a world title in consecutive years and the only team to have won it three times. You know, there's some pretty big titles to our names. But what you'll see is that on this slide, there's no mention of Paralympic medals. That's because I didn't win any. And for a very long time, I felt like a total failure because I hadn't achieved those medals that I set out to achieve. Nothing else mattered, you know, I'd won the World Championships, but that didn't matter to me. I hadn't achieved what I wanted to achieve, which was a Paralympic medal. One day my mum got out all of my medals and all of the trophies and things John, Steve and myself had won along the way. And she put them all out. And she said, take a look at this. It's not about that one piece of silverware, it's about this. All of these things you have won on the way are part of the journey. And it was that moment that I realized that I should be proud of what I've achieved. It wasn't, well, it was heartbreaking. It was disappointing to not have that one piece of silverware, but it was, it didn't make me a failure because of it. It made me still a champion 
I'd still done all of those things along the way. And actually, I'm super proud of that now. I'm proud of the fact that John, Steve and I did an awful lot on the journey to the Paralympics. There is no greater privilege than representing your country. You put on that awful track suit with the huge lions and the Great Britain, and you go to a Paralympic venue and you arrive, and there's no greater feeling. And it's been magical, and I've been so, so privileged to have been able to represent my country at the Games, including London, racing in Weymouth and Portland Harbour. I'll never forget that. I lit the Paralympic cauldron in front of my friends and family. Arriving in Beijing to find ourselves plastered on a hundred foot building was pretty cool and pretty intimidating, I can imagine, for the foreign teams as well. And of course, sailing in Brazil, in Rio, under Christ, the Regima and Sugarloaf Mountain. These are all really incredible places and incredible experiences. And ultimately, I got to race with two of my best friends and wear that tracksuit with Great Britain on it, which was a huge privilege. So I'm going to take you back to this moment, which is in Rio. And there's no two ways about it. Rio for us was um, a rocky Paralympics is probably the best way to put it. I mean, I'm not going to lie, in the first few days, we were sailing like complete donkeys. I mean, we, we hadn't sailed so badly in quite a long time. And the boat just wasn't working. We weren't sailing well. We weren't feeling like ourselves. We actually, I think, came last in one of those races as well. So not our finest work. Until this day happened. And I still remember the feeling of this day. Now the breeze came up in the bay and I call it the click. This click comes into the boat and it's just this magic feeling where you don't need to say anything. The communication is just automatic. The boat feels like it's on fire and everything is just clicking and working as it should. And that day we won all three races on the trot and our games were starting to look just that bit more hopeful. Unfortunately, this was where our Paralympic Games ended. There's no secret that we were quite a feisty boat uh, to race against. And in particular, we had many uh, an incident with the French team. This day was no exception. We'd gotten into it at a Winwood Mark with the French team. And as is racing, as I believe racing should be, if you do something wrong, you either accept it and, and sail the rest of the day and think, oh, am I going to end up in the protest room later over rule breakage or I'm going to do a penalty turn? We decided that we would probably pushed it a bit far with the French team. So we went to do our penalty turns. Unfortunately for us, um, Team USA decided to protest us on the fact that we were in their way whilst we did our penalty turns. Now, I can't go too much into what actually happened in the protest room, um, but the bottom line is not all the evidence was able to be presented. And unfortunately, Team USA uh, won the protest against us. And as a result, we were disqualified, which completely destroyed our hopes of meddling at Rio. With a disqualification on our scoreline, there was really no coming back from this with one day's racing left. And I was broken. I was a, a broken human being. I came out of the protest room. I was crying from the minute I left the protest room right up until I got back to the team hotel. And I was in a very bad place and I had realised, obviously, that our games is over and there's nothing we can do about it. We've got no control over the situation. And I was on the phone to my sister on, on FaceTime 
my sister's still in the UK at this point, and she'd stayed up to hear the result of the protest with USA. So I'm telling her what's happened and and crying and sobbing and making a huge mess of myself and explaining to her that basically the games is over and I am heartbroken. Now, whilst I'm on the phone to my sister, there's a knock at my door. And it's just John, and he has come to get one of my not so secret stash of chocolate bars. It's a bit of a, a bit of a thing with me that I am rather fond of aero chocolate. And now don't judge me, but during the Rio Paralympic week, I ate 48 aero bars. What can I say? I'm a comfort eater, but also it helps with weight gain. So really there's a performance uh, gain there, or at least that's how I framed it. So John's come to get one of the arrows, obviously. He, he enjoys a, a spot of chocolate as well. And I obviously give him a chocolate bar and he goes on his way back to his room. Now, I obviously close up the door and go back to finish the phone call with my sister. And I go to sit down at the desk. And the next thing I know, I'm on the floor. Of course, I've broken the chair. I think maybe those errors had something to do with it, but I can't be 100% sure. Now, at this point, I am in floods of tears, crying with not only heartbreak, frustration that my Paralympics is over, but now also embarrassment because I'm such a fatty that I've broken hotel property. So not only have I, have I fallen out of the Paralympic Games uh, and my hunt for a medal, but also now I've destroyed property by being too fat. My sister, however, is crying with laughter. She's realised what I've done and she is just howling down the phone at me because she is finding this whole situation hilarious now. But she then managed to pull it together and she said this to me. Sometimes you just have to accept that God has another plan for you. Now, I think she was right. And luckily, I know what that plan is. So that was the advert for the 2016 Vendée Globe. And of course, we've had another edition of the race since then in 2020. So the concept of the Vendée is pretty simple. You come out of France, you turn left, you head to the bottom of the globe and you race all the way around the bottom until you turn left and find France once again. 24,000 miles around the world, nonstop, without assistance and single-handedly quite literally in my case. To this day, no disabled female sailor has ever attempted the race. And actually only 11 women have completed the Vendée. The 2020 edition saw the largest number of female sailors, including one of my true icons and heroes, Pip Hare. I quite often get asked why on earth I'd want to do something like the Vendée Globe. 
when you show that video, you normally get a reaction along the lines of, are you mental? And potentially, yes, there is an element of crazy in me that wants to take on this challenge. But I also want to do it to prove that I can. And because someone told me I couldn't. When I first met Ellen MacArthur, she was preparing for her own Vendée Globe. And she was told that not only was she a woman and therefore couldn't do it, but also she was too small. So how could she possibly do it? But she went and did the Vendée anyway. So to me, that proving people wrong and that determination to go out and potentially that stubbornness uh, is, uh, is definitely a part of it. I also want to do it um, as part of the reinstate movement we have for Paralympic sailing. Now, in 2015, we got the really bad news that sailing was being removed from the Paralympic Games. So 2016 was our last Paralympics as sailing as a sport. Since then, we have been fighting and campaigning to get sailing back into the Paralympics where it belongs. Sailing, it's said, it is not a massively inclusive sport. So to me, if I can go out and do the Vendée and prove that I can sail against able-bodied people, then sailing really is inclusive. So it's another powerful argument as to why sailing should be back in the Paralympic Games. I also want to kick in a door and challenge perceptions of what is possible. When I first set out on this journey, to do the Vendée, I went about getting my Yachtmaster ticket. I went to a sailing school, obviously, to look into doing my Yachtmaster. And unfortunately, I met the senior instructor at the school and he took one look at me, one look at my arm and said, how could you possibly hold on to a boat? And essentially refused to teach me. Now, unluckily for him, I found a sailing school that would teach me. And I was very lucky that they didn't seem to be bothered about my disability. And I did get my Yachtmaster. And not only did I pass my Yachtmaster exam, but in the year that I took it, I won the Yachtmaster of the Year Award. And as a result, my examiner, Philippe, took the trophy that I'd won and been presented with at the London Boat Show and he took it to the sailing school that had refused to teach me and he said to them that they shouldn't have been so quick to judge me because they'd missed out on the opportunity to teach the Yacht Master of the Year. So that for me was a really a really powerful moment because I'd been judged on my appearance, I'd been judged on a perception. So if I can challenge those perceptions that's why I'm doing this. And I want to prove to people that if you think you can do something, that that self-belief is there, then anything is possible. Now, during all my yacht master drama, I was at a low point in my in my life, realizing that people were still judging disabled athletes. And it was frustrating. And I was thinking to myself, why am I doing this? Why am I doing this? I'm not making a difference, I'm not helping. Until I got a message all the way from Australia from this really lovely girl called Renee. Now, it, Renee sent me a photo of herself and she was wearing a Hannah Stodel Racing T-shirt. And she said, I just want you to know, today I'm going out to learn to sail. And she'd been following me on Instagram for ages. and I couldn't quite understand it, but it transpired that she'd been in an accident and she'd been housebound for two years. But she'd been following my social media and my messaging and my constant pushing of self-belief and saying, just keep believing in yourself. It doesn't matter what other people think. If you think you can do it, you can do it. And she'd taken that and she'd gone sailing. She'd gotten out of her flat 
She'd gotten into her wheelchair and she'd found the nearest sailability group she could find and she'd gone sailing. And that for me was my whole campaign made. That one person I'd shown it was possible if you believed it was. That was it. That was it made. So if I can do that for that one person, that is an incredible part of the story. So that's what I'm doing. I'm out training, getting as many miles as I can, learning along the way. And it's been a steep learning curve, you know, transitioning from short inshore racing on a keelboat with two other people to sailing a 40 foot boat on my own has been an uphill struggle for sure. And the learning curve has been ridiculously steep. But I've loved it. And the more I do, the more I realize how much I love the challenge, how much I love figuring out how to do things and how much I genuinely enjoy what I do. So let me show you around my luxury class 40. <laughs> I jest. On the left is the kitchen area, as you can see, filled with mod cons, uh, ranging from a jet boil to some pot noodles. There's no oven on board these uh, racing boats. We don't do that. It weighs too much. So we have uh, a jet boil or a kettle, essentially, that can boil a litre of water at a time. And we eat a lot of rehydrated food because that's what you can store on board. On the top right, we have the ensuite bathroom facilities. As you can see, they're very spacious and, uh, and luxurious. <laughs> Uh, not much in the way of privacy, but when you're on your own, it doesn't really matter because there's no one there to watch you anyway. And on the bottom there is the bedroom. As you can see, there's a lot of uh, electronic equipment present in these boats because we do have to sleep at some point. Admittedly, we only sleep in very short periods, uh, 10 to 20 minutes at a time. So we have to rely a lot on our electronics on board from the autopilot to radar to our AIS systems to help us sail the boat while we have a quick nap. Now I get asked a lot why the class 40 and why not jump straight into the Amokas? Well, first off, the Amokas used in the Vendée Globe race are 60 foot and really, really expensive. Secondly, I would scare myself senseless if I tried to sail one of those first without learning how to sail offshore safely in something a bit more manageable like the 40. So the 40 is, is very, very similar to the Amokka. They're low cost, one of the biggest selling points as far as we were concerned. There's a really big uh, Grand Prix circuit for them. They have lots of racing. They do have a world championship, which is great. They have very, very stringent measurement and safety requirements. And they also are water ballasted, a lot like the Amokas. So you can pump water into tanks in the boat uh, in order to keep them upright and to make up for the distinct lack of crew that you have. So at the moment, I charter a boat from a French team and it has been an uphill struggle. Uh, the aim at the moment is now to be able to buy my own class 40 so I can continue training and build up my mileage in a, a safe way. So that's the aim for next year is to buy my own class 40. But aside from obviously all of the training and sailing I'm doing, I do a few other things uh, to keep myself busy. Uh, one of them being obviously speaking. Uh, I do a lot of speaking. I work for a very, very cool company in the leadership and development training area. So I work a lot with corporate companies on their management styles and things about resilience, etc. There's a lot of lessons in sailing that can very easily be shared into business. I'm also a fully qualified coach. So I spend a lot of my time coaching other people uh, on the racing circuit, which I love. I love working with someone on those 1% gains and seeing them really make a difference on the water. And I'm also a tactician, so I jump on board different boats here and there to essentially tell them which way to go and hopefully from time to time get it right. 
And of course, I'm very lucky to have been welcomed onto the Solent uh, by the team on Cobra. Now, I pull Cobra up quite a lot in my talks because for me, they're one of the best examples of inclusivity when it comes to sailing on the Solent and on the racing circuit that I can give because A, I'm a female and I'm driving Cobra and B, I'm disabled. And I'm sailing on this able-bodied boat with all of this, these incredible guys and this incredible team. Now, Cobra for me were really an advert for not judging people and not looking at those perceptions and just saying, are you good enough to do this job? And I was very lucky with the owners, Mike and Seb, and also their skipper, Stevie. They didn't judge me for my disability. They didn't judge me because I was a woman. They just said, can you drive this boat fast? So I've been really lucky to have been welcomed on board Cobra in the Solent. And I really hope that more teams take their attitude when it comes to crew selection. Like it's not about rock star status. It's not about things like how much you get paid. It's can you do the job? That's all, all that matters. And I'm, I'm so, so grateful. Uh, to Cobra for welcoming me on. So I said I'd share with you some lessons, <laughs> some things I've learned uh, when it comes to opening the tin. Always, always, always have a backup plan to the backup plan. I have learned this the hard way offshore at the most inconvenient time. I'm super lucky to be sponsored by Imre and they're the best example of this I can give you. I was offshore when all of my computing power failed, I had no way of navigating on the computer, nothing electronically. But because I'm slightly obsessed with charts, I'd packed all of the charts, despite my team saying, you're ridiculous, why would you need this? You've got two computers, you've got an iPad, you don't need all this, <laughs> all these charts, but I'd pack them anyway. And thank goodness I did, because I could still navigate because I had my charts. <laughs> so thank goodness have a backup plan. Definitely a, a very, <laughs> very strong lesson for me. Understanding a team. I've been fortunate to race with the team and also understood what motivated them to get them through the really tough times offshore. It's the same in everyday life. If you understand the people around you, it definitely helps. Happy teams work better. I know this for sure. Um, I've had a particularly stressful round Britain and Ireland race where my team weren't happy and it really, really affected not only the watch system, but then it started to filter to the other watch system. It really affected the boat. So now when I look at taking a team offshore, I make sure we balance the personalities. Also, it's OK to be scared. It took me a long time to realize that when I first went off on my own, I was scared, but it's okay to be scared. It's okay to admit that you're scared. Don't let it prevent you from taking those opportunities. And that's the same with any challenge. You're gonna be scared, you're gonna have fears. It's going to be daunting, but don't let it stop you. And finally, of course, communication is the root of everything. And one of my favorite rules on board is only shout at people when they're likely to die. And it's one of the few things I do say to people when they come sailing with me, when we're sailing corporate um, days out, etc. We will only shout at you if you're likely to die. So do please follow me. Uh, I'm quite open on my social media, so I do have to apologize for that. I like to share everything, be that the ups and the downs of campaigning. So do please follow me. I, I do write a blog as well where I'm pretty open about how I'm feeling. Uh, of course, my personal uh, social media is a lot about my dogs. I'm a self, self-confessed self crazy dog lady as well as a, <laughs> a sailor. So do please join me. Uh, I'd love to interact with you because it's not just about me on this journey. It's about sharing it as well, because that makes it so much more rewarding for me. So I'll leave you with this. Challenges are what make life interesting. Overcoming them is what makes life meaningful. So thank you very much for your time tonight. And if you've got any questions for me, put them in the chat and I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs>